Thank you so much and good afternoon to you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be in this panel and a privilege to share the table with Professor Goldberg and with these great colleagues. Um, so my presentation, uh, we haven't arranged things, but I think it's it, it fits quite well after Ines and um, Professor Anna, uh, because I'm going to talk of some of the few, some of the issues that they have raised. Uh, so my presentation will focus on how a critical post-positivist researcher looks at what has been labeled the digital turn as a societal and epistemic transformation. And my concern with the fact that despite the term turn embodies a move, and the digital realm points to the online sphere. The fact is that digital does not break away from the offline realm. And so it is not detached from the prevailing material and ideational orders, neither from existing power relations. And so based upon this, there are two main questions that I would like to share with you and that have made me company throughout these five years where I have been researching uh, the internet. And the first is, how has big data and automating anal analysis been contrib contributing to maintain and validate structural inequalities in society? And from where I stand, it all starts with an ontological, epistemological and methodological merge of on the one hand, a positivist chimera that the big data opens up. And on the other hand, a certain sense of what I would say a, a digital universalism. The term is not mine, but I'm going to make it to, to encapsulate um, a larger reality, as you'll see. Uh, and by a positivist chimera, I mean an illusion that finally there is the possibility of a genuine knowledge derived from vast and digital, detailed digital footprints, privileging accurate algorithmic calculability, the fascination that Professor Anna just talked to about. And on the other hand, the digital universalism, by which I mean three convergent leeways it can unfold and which are the three big narratives that sustain uh, the a critical promise of the digital, uh, which is the digital universal access, the digital universal knowledge and the digital universal efficiency. So the idea of the digital universal access uh, and the consensualized narrative that virtually everyone, regardless of class, gender, religion, ethnicity, nationality, geography or profession, can access the web and that that can happen virtually at all times and at all places. So everything can go, everyone can go online. Um, the second um, narrative is the idea that of the digital universal knowledge, which go in line with the narratives that sustain that virtually everything is or will be online. And so through the analysis of big data, not only one can identify trends, behaviors and patterns never before possible, but everything and everyone is virtually traceable by everyone at any given time. So there is this idea that we can know everything from everyone at any time. And this has a lot allowed us to have access to wide and detailed knowledge never before possible. And the third narrative is the idea of the digital universal efficiency and the belief that the use of big data and algorithms to support research allows for neutrality because it apparently is just based on facts and events and an enormous efficiency, taking into account decision time, resource allocation and accuracy. But as the online and the digital are not detached from the offline, but rather convergent and sometimes even fooling each other. There are fallacies that these narratives of the digital and on how to approach the digital entail. And I would like to highlight three fallacies, one for each macro narrative that I just mentioned. The first fallacy has to do with the universal access. If it is true that the digital is virtually accessible to everyone, it is also true that the classic divide of the haves and the have-nots applies to this scenario, as affordance to acquire internet-based devices and internet service are not universally equal. The opportunity to be in a geographic zone with internet coverage is not universally shared, nor is digital media literacy to use and to interpret the digital. The second is the fallacy that the digital provides full universal knowledge, as if the experience of the digital is not lived and experienced differently concerning our own subjectivities, and if those differences were not pivotal to generate knowledge. 
both epistemology and political action are anchored in localization politics, always depending on the position that each actor, understood individually or collectively, occupies in this arena and subsequently in a hierarchical network of power. And so big data is imbued with subject subjectivity, the subjectivity of generating the data and the subjectivity of analyzing the data. Uh, and so data are genderous, racialized, entrenched in the class system. And this subjectivity stems and embodies which data is relevant, how data is collected and how to interpret it. And may hence produce biased results, reinforcing or overcoming existing discrimination or, and privilege or producing new ones. The third is a fallacy that big data and automating analysis are neutral, quick and sense efficient. So while they allow us to make apparently strong evidence-based decision by hiding subjectivities and contexts, big data and automating analysis may in fact provide us incomplete and biased misleading analysis. Events per se, facts per se, say extraordinarily little if devoided of a subjective narrative that frames them. And so we have to take that into account. So facing this, how do digital methods by focusing on big data comply with those fallacies and hence contribute to maintain and validate structural inequalities in society? And to develop this idea, I'm going to bring two examples. The first example is taken by the book Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile, Police and Punish the Poor by Virginia Eubanks, where situations where she presents situations in which people have been denied access to healthcare, housing and custody of their children due to an algorithmic deliberation about their lives and profiles, um, with a specific focus on how these automated decision making for the granting of social support differently impact racialized groups, working class, and also identifying gender implications. So governance institutions decided to make the decision using method, uh, digital methods to make the decision of whether or not to grant social support to citizens supported by algorithms, as it is understood that they allow enormous efficiency and are promising their, in their ability to detect potential fraud. And so elites in public opinion tend to see these algorithms as the instrument per excellence for the ordering and regulation of societies. And in need, we need to have reliable tools to fairly and accurately manage public policies. The issue is not the need to develop methods and tools to do it, but rather the possibilities and the limitation of using big data and automating mechanisms for that. So concretely, the issue is what these data and methods don't tell us and should tell us, or at least we should know, and the implications of that silence. And there are always two sides of the same coin. And if for the establishment, for the government in this case, algorithms are effective and efficient, the fact that human lives are translated into mere measurable digital data, these missing subjectivities, power structures and contexts, and yet with the possibility to condition choices, opportunities, and in the limit, who lives and who lies, who dies is particularly concerning. One example Eubanks gives in the book is the one of Kim and Kevin's family who have five children, have seven children, including Sophie, who has cerebral palsy and who has health insurance that covers her expenses. And in 2008, Kevin lost his job and with that, his health insurance. They succeeded in getting five of the children to have access to Medicaid and the rest of the family applied for the Healthy Indiana Plan. As soon as the process started, four members of the household became ill and Kim realized that she would not be able to handle the paperwork at the same time that she took care of them and asked to put her application on hold and the situation was said to be taken care of. In the meantime, the family received a letter from the FSSA addressed to Sophia informing her that she had been put on the Medicaid system, who had been put off. Uh, within a month since she has failed to cooperate as the algorithm detected a failure in cooperating. And with that on the record, health insurance would be easily denied to the whole family from that moment on, not just for those providers, but for all those providers. So the algorithm decided that one fail, regardless of the situation, meant that it wasn't worth it and eligible for the for them. For the, for the insurance. This is for the, the public policies, but we can have for research as well examples. 
Uh, it's the second example uh, concerns the analysis of narratives and counter narratives of migrants in Europe um, and social media provides a space for the um, for the migrants to tell their own stories to give an account for their own uh, stories um, identities horizons and even usually overcoming the invisibility or the otherness uh, to which they are often corned into. And this happens through the production of posts through which express their experience in the face of the conditions of their crossings, the reasons for immigration, the violence of the European Union and their externalized uh, borders, the tension centers and so forth. Um, but merely to use this data of the network analysis to see how counter narratives on the dominant narratives that there is on the European media concerning refugees and migrants so you just use the numbers, the number of posts, the reach of those posts is, for example, to dismiss the fact that the relationship between the micro narratives and the macro narratives is always a relationship of power, where the micro narratives always happen in relation or in tension to the macro narratives. It's also to dismiss that the production of content on social network can al allows an unprecedented reach and impact of the message in the history of communication, but that the, the logic of disseminating content is usually in line with the prevailing hegemony. Um, and uh, also uh, the counter narratives of migrants, refugees in the Western public sphere are decoded from a hegemonic enunciation locus. And so the structuring hierarchies of the international system inform the degree through, it, through which these counter narratives are implicitly or explicitly interpreted. And now I get to the second question and I'm concluding is so how have post positivist perspectives been adopting a critical perspective towards big data analysis adding critique to descriptions patterns and trends. And first and foremost, it is important to highlight that post positivist perspectives can't shy away from big data that's not a an hypothesis in today's world, but through merely focusing on quantitative data and fostering a positive positivist analysis towards social phenomena processes and agencies is a process that is closer to record data than to critically explore and analyze them, as McKinty said. So what should be done here is a concession to positivism and mixed methods should be used. But I think it's very important in this. And now with this, I conclude, I rec recall again Eubanks when she's she said that um, there is the need to politically problematize technology and to deconstruct an increasingly accentuated trait of our societies and which is how we come to know what not to know. And so it is important in these mixed methodologies to understand what big data tell us and what with other methodologies, non post positivist or non positive methodologies we can bring in order to get to know what not to know and bring it and render it visible and bring it to the analysis. Thank you so much.